All right, ladies and gentlemen, now we're talking about Gibbs free energy. So, so far we've talked about enthalpy, and what sign of enthalpy is generally spontaneous? Negative. Negative. And we've talked about entropy, and the sign for entropy that's thermodynamically favored is? Positive. Positives. And I, I have made a point to say generally when I've talked about enthalpy and entropy. And now we're going to talk about um, Gibbs free energy. Gibbs free energy is the amount of energy that um, is available to do work on the surroundings. Okay. Um, Delta G. How many people are LOTR fans? Lord of the Rings. Three, Lord of the Rings. <laughs> Harry Potter. Well, just take yourself back to Lord of the Rings. For, uh, you know, I had a dog named Frodo like a million years ago. Was going to have a dog named Gandalf, but didn't. Um, uh, so you know the story behind Lord of the Rings. There are all those rings, and they give power. But there's one ring that rules them all, and everybody wants that one ring because that's the most powerful. So if we're using an LOTR analogy here, delta H and delta S are rings. That is true. But Gibbs free energy is the ring that rules them all because Gibbs free energy determines absolutely positively whether something is thermodynamically favored. Whether it is thermodynamically favored. Uh, last Friday I gave you this equation really quick. This is Gibbs free energy equation where delta G is equal to the enthalpy minus the entropy when you multiply the entropy times the temperature. It must be in Kelvin. It must be in Kelvin. Or you can rewrite this equation, delta G ought is equal to the same darn equation. What does the ought mean? Standard. The ought means standard conditions, which is the way you would find this stuff in real life at room temperature, one atmosphere of pressure, and any concentration that um, exists would be one atmosphere. All right, so now given any equation and some um, values, you could solve for delta H, delta S, and delta G. So I'm going to do that for you right this moment in time. Okay, if this is happening at 25 degrees C, and we know it is because they've given us the ought value, we can do this. Um, let's do delta H first. We know delta H is um, the products minus the reactants. We are paying attention that these values are listed for one mole. And if we don't have one mole in our reaction, we multiply it times whatever we do have. So um, these products, and here is SO3's value, minus the reactants, two of these. Plus um, the value for O2. It's not given. Oh, it is given. They gave it to you nicely. Delta H for all elements is zero. So um, delta H in this case is 198 kilojoules uh, per mole. Kilojoules per mole. Now, if um, you had to look at this on its own, what kind of reaction is this? Exothermal. Exothermic is generally spontaneous in the forward direction. Let's look at delta S. And it is also um, uh, products minus reactants. Remember that there's always a value for everything because everything has some energy in it because it is not at absolute zero. And the value I get for this is minus 187 joules. And now it asks me to calculate delta G. Delta G is equal to delta H minus delta S T. So I have a negative 198 minus my delta S. And I notice that these values are different, and they must be the same in order to use the equation. 
I'm going to um, convert the entropy into um, kilojoules, so I'm going to divide it by 1,000. So this would be 0.187 times um, uh, 25 degrees plus 273 is uh, 298. And my value for delta G ought is 100, negative 142 kilojoules per mole. Since this is a negative value, since this is a negative value, it is spontaneous in the forward direction. Spontaneous in the forward react. Uh, direction. Shouldn't that 0.187 be a negative? Let you yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So delta G rules above everything else. If delta G is negative, the reaction is spontaneous in the forward direction. If delta G is zero, then the equation, uh, then the reaction is at equilibrium. If it's zero, it's at equilibrium. If delta G is a positive number, the reaction is not spontaneous in the forward direction, but is spontaneous in the reverse reaction. Here is, hang on for one second. Here is a trick question I guarantee that you will get. In the question, it'll give you, let's say, a delta H um, value. It'll tell you that the reaction's at equilibrium, and you're expected to figure out delta S. You must know that they've given you the variable that you're missing, delta G. It is zero. I've never seen a test, my own included, where I didn't rely on that knowledge in your brain to figure out uh, an answer. Do you have a question? Um, so whenever delta G is negative, does that, that doesn't mean that it's always going to be exothermic, does it? We, you don't even think about it that way. What you, what you think about is energy leaves the system, which is the equation, mm -hmm. to the surroundings, which is the same kind of process we think of as enthalpy, but we call that exothermic. We don't use that term for Gibbs free energy, but the um, transfer of energy is indeed the same. Okay, so it'll never happen. You would never use the word exothermic with Gibbs free energy. You would say that energy left the system to the surrounding, and that energy did work on the surrounding. All right, now I guarantee you are going to see this graph again. So this is the Haber process where N2 is combining with H2 to form ammonia. And we're looking at an equilibrium um, uh, expression here. On this side, at uh, time equals zero, all we have are the reactants. And at this side, all we have is pure product. And we look at this and we see uh, the delta G is forming a graph like this. By definition, if you want to see the um, equilibrium point, you would look at the lowest point in this graph. This would be where equilibrium occurs. Now, you could read the x uh, axes to see the concentration of reactants and products at equilibrium. You can also um, use this to think of uh, a couple of associations. Right. First of all, looking at it in, in, in terms of uh, delta G, here is where equilibrium occurs. Delta G, when delta G is zero, that means that the equilibrium is one, okay. by definition. So K is equal to one. If we look at this part of the reaction, when we're starting out until we get to equilibrium, 
then it is spontaneous in the, per, in the forward direction. Spontaneous in the forward direction because we have not reached equilibrium. We are moving towards equilibrium. Once we get to this point, it is equilibrium and it is spontaneous in both directions. Spontaneous in both directions. Now, as we move away from that point, it is non-spontaneous in the forward direction because we're moving away from equilibrium, but it is spontaneous in the reverse direction. So far, so good? Okay. So that leaves us with these um, thought processes. When delta g is 0, k is equal to 1. When delta g is less than 1, uh, less than 0, I'm sorry, it is spontaneous in the forward reaction. And if it's spontaneous in the forward reaction, equilibrium lies more towards the products, yes? When delta G is greater than zero, it is non-spontaneous in the forward reaction. Equilibrium lies um, with the favors the reactants. Good? Um, like delta H and delta S, delta G is a state function. What's state function mean? Yep, and many paths give the same outcome. Very nice. Uh, so there's a number of ways that you can calculate delta G. You take the products minus the reactants. It also works the same way Hess's law works. Let's quickly do um, the products minus the reactants. Find the free energy of formation for the oxidation of water to produce hydrogen peroxide. Uh, I believe Friday I told you to recall that the delta G for elements, also zero. So um, delta H and delta G for all elements is equal to zero. Not so for delta S. And the reason why? There's always kinetic energy, right? The, the entropy for a perfect crystal at absolute zero is zero. Anything else that's not at absolute zero or is not a perfect crystal has entropy. So to uh, solve this problem very quickly, it's uh, react products minus reactants. And so that would be 2 times a negative 27.2 minus 2 times a negative 56.7. And I have that to be um, 59 kilocalories per mole. Kilocalories per mole. Does this happen spontaneously? No. no. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the wait. No, it does not. It is a positive number, so it is non-spontaneous in the forward direction, which means that that bottle of hydrogen peroxide in your medicine cabinet eventually just makes water and some um, oxygen bubbles. Okay. Is that is that like only to leave it open, or is that like even if it's in? Even if. Um, it, it does, it's kept in a brown bottle because um, it is, uh, it, it decomposes in sunlight quicker, so they put it in a brown bottle to delay that, but it, it will. How long would it normally take to be a big bottle? A big bottle? Oh, I don't know. It's what? three, what you buy is 3%, what I have is 30, which is kind of scary. It's, quite the oxidized agent. I'm, I'm not a fan of it. But anyway, um, I think if uh, you took it home and uh, left it for a couple years, it would definitely be not what you wanted it to be. Okay, and then you can work it like Hess's Law as well. Here we have um, the formation of um, CO2 using a diamond. And that has a delta G that is negative. And then graphite forming CO2. Remember, graphite and diamond are allotropes. 
of carbon and allotrope means it has a different form at the same temperature. Sulfur also has allotropes. Um, so this is our target reaction. We need to manipulate these in order to get to our target. However, we manipulate um, our equation. We must manipulate our values as well. So I think if I take C as a diamond plus O2 yields CO2 in this direction, and then flip the, the other one around and make this CO2 yields um, uh, carbon as graphite plus O2. And so I will flip this term around. I do my crossing out and I have uh, a diamond. A diamond going to graphite. My delta G is a negative value. So does this happen spontaneously? Yes. Does it happen quickly? No. No, it does not. On Friday we talked about something that um, doesn't that happens very, very slowly but is spontaneous. We say that's under kinetic control. It's the rate that um, really makes a difference to us instead of the spontaneity. So, in case I didn't make this crystal clear, if delta G is positive, it is not spontaneous in uh, the forward direction. If delta G is positive, it is spontaneous in the forward direction. This is the money bit of today's lesson. This is the important thing that you need to be able to do. And I guarantee you will see questions from me and questions on the AP exam about um, specific conditions. And it all relies on a mathematical equation that is Gibbs free energy equation. All right. Our goal is to figure out whether something will be spontaneous and at what temperatures it will be spontaneous. If we have delta H that is negative, which is thermodynamically favored on its own, and delta S that is positive, also thermodynamically favored, when you pop it into this equation, no matter what the temperature is, you will get a negative value of delta G. And because you have a negative value of delta G, it is spontaneous. So given the favored conditions, it will be, delta G will be less than zero, so spontaneous at any temperature, at any temperature. Remember, we're talking about Kelvin temperature, so it will always be a positive number. Now, if we have the inverse, where delta H is um, thermodynamically not favored and delta S is thermodynamically not favored, there is no way that you could take a positive delta H number, I don't care what the magnitude is, and a negative delta S number, again, I don't care what the magnitude is, and come up with a negative value for delta G. That means it is never spontaneous. Doesn't matter what the temperature is. The thought process um, where it takes some thinking is when you have both um, uh, variables at the same sign. When delta H is positive, which is not thermodynamically favored, and S is positive, which is, it depends on the temperature. And it is spontaneous. That means delta G is a negative number when the temperature part of this equation is high. So um, let's say we have a high temperature, delta S is positive, that would make this quantity a large negative number that would make up for this positive number, giving you a negative delta G. See how that works? Okay. And then um, when they're both negative, this is favored, this is not. As long as this portion of the equation, because if it's a negative number, this minus minus this negative quantity would be adding a positive. As long as this part of the equation is a small number, 
delta G can be negative. In my own little pea brain, I've um, thought of a way to remember how this works by thinking, okay, positive and positive are high, like a positive number is a big number, high temperature, negative, negative, low, that's an, a negative number is a low temperature, and that helps me get through just the, like, uh, is it high or low temperature? I guarantee if you use that rationale as a justification, you will get no points. What you have to do, and the AP folks are very happy for you to justify using math. Justify using math. So if you wanted to prove it was high temperatures that it was uh, working with, you should find uh, do the equation with the high temperature. Say assume uh, delta H is um, a positive 10 and delta S is a positive 1 and do it high temperature and show that you get a negative value out of it. Okay? All right. Now, these next statements were specifically included in the AP ACORN book, which is what kids need to know in the AP test this year. Specific inclusions to me are red flags that you will be tested on this material. So we'll spend two minutes talking about it and then I'll let you go. All right. If Gibbs free energy is positive, that means that it is not a spontaneous process. You can use an external or outside source of energy to over overcome that um, lack of spontaneity or um, lack of thermodynamic favor. Uh, anybody ever heard of electroplating metal? Right. If you have um, sterling silver jewelry, generally they take a base metal, base means cheaper, and they electroplate the um, silver onto the piece of jewelry. So it's cheaper to make. The most of it is not silver, it's something else. Um, that is not thermodynamically favored. They electrocute it in order to get that to occur. Anybody ever had um, something chromed? Yeah, wheels chromed or something like that. Same process, not electrochemically favored. They um, electrocute it to add the energy. Uh, we're going to study that when we come back. That's electrolysis. Okay, uh, light may also be a source of energy that drives a, pro a process that is not thermodynamically um, favored. All right, when, you, when, we, when we talk about the ionization energy of an atom, what does that mean? The energy needed to do what? To produce part of one large uh, money. <laughs> to remove the outermost electron, the first ionization energy would be the energy needed to remove the outermost or valence electron. All right, that is always an endothermic reaction, always. You have to put some energy into the atom in order to grab away the um, electron. You can use light energy in order to do that. In fact, it happens all the time. All right, and it is, um, uh, the energy is in terms of a photon of energy that is absorbed. All right. Um, photosynthesis has a delta G aught at standard conditions, a delta G value of plus 2880 kilojoules per mole. Uh, does that happen spontaneously? No. No, it doesn't. Where is the energy? The sun is giving us some energy for that to occur. Okay. Now, um, it only furnishes um, energy in photons of light between uh, the range of 400 to 700 nanometers. I can see a question coming where um, I ask you to figure out the energy um, required to make this happen. And I give you the frequencies of a bunch of light and tell you uh, 
to figure out the energy and what you were going to have to do is use uh, the equation energy is equal to Planck's constant times the frequency of light. Everybody remember that? And figure out um, energy equal to this number. As soon as you hit the delta G value, it will happen because delta G will be, um, uh, you hit the requirement and it's going to happen spontaneously. Good? Now, uh, how many people are taking Bio 2? Bio 2. How many people have memorized the Krebs cycle? How many people remember the number of molecules that ATP, ATP that come out of one turn of the Krebs cycle? 32 to 36. Is it 36 for both uh, parts? I don't remember either. I used to remember. I used to have to. Whatever. Okay. You can use the um, biochemical energy source, ATP, to, um, to make a thermodynamically unfavorable reaction go. When ATP loses one of its phosphates to ADP, energy is released. That energy can be used to make something thermodynamically unfavored because these are inclusion statements, I think we ought to pay attention to this stuff. Okay. All right, we are done.